Hello, lovely internet strangers. Welcome to the next episode of The Anti-Feminist Diaries. I haven't done one of these in a while, so I thought I would return to this series and address a request by one of my subscribers. I hope I am pronouncing his name correctly. If not, I apologize. Tariq Khan said that he saw on Twitter that I have loved stuff coming out of John McWhorter, and it would be cool to hear more about my thoughts and comments. And I told him that I find John McWhorter's writing on anti-racism as a religion particularly compelling. So I'm going to start by discussing that article to provide a framework, and then I'm going to share a story from my life that relates to the concept of anti-racism as a religion. If sharing my stories from my time working in publishing is taking a risk, then sharing my stories from my current participation in various partner dance scenes is even riskier, but I do think it's important to share these stories that probably no one else is. So let's discuss anti-racism as a religion, shall we? I will link this article in the description. It's called The Virtue Signalers Won't Change the World. John McWhorter references the history of the feminist movement as generally being described in three distinct phases and that the anti-racism movement can also be described in three distinct phases, the abolitionist movement, the civil rights movement, and now third wave anti-racism, which is attacking the psychological basis for racism, essentially trying to eradicate racist thought and working to dismantle the structures of white supremacy. And he references a blog that I used to read back in the day called Stuff White People Like, which was popular in 2010. So this was when I was in college. For those of you who have never read the blog, he describes it as a wry self-parody of the cultural mores that had settled in by roughly the late 1990s amidst a certain stripe of educated white people. Being offended was one of the cleverest entries, describing a kind of almost recreational quest to take umbrage on behalf of people other than whites. But as he says in this article, things have shifted now, where that's actually a good thing. McWhorter describes how the first two phases of the anti-racism movement had a religious component to them in the language that was used, by the leaders of the movement. McWhorter says that it seems like the new phase of the movement is taking a secular approach, but actually it's a religious movement that's not using traditional religious terminology. He elaborates on this as follows. The idea that whites are permanently stained by their white privilege, gaining moral absolution only by eternally attesting to it, is the third wave's version of original sin. The idea of a someday when America will come to terms with race is as vaguely specified a guidepost as Judgment Day. Explorations as to whether an opinion is problematic are equivalent to explorations of that which may be blasphemous. The social mauling of the person with problematic thoughts parallels the excommunication of the heretic. What is called virtue signaling, then, channels the impulse that might lead a Christian to an aggressive display of her faith in Jesus. There is even a certain church lady heir to much of the patrolling on race these days, an almost performative joy in dogpiling on the transgressor, which under our religious analysis is perfectly predictable. Add in the tendency to let pass certain wrinkles in the fabric as complex, the new religion as a matter of faith entails that one suspends disbelief at certain points out of respect to the larger narrative. Beyond a certain point, one must not press too hard when asking a priest why God allows bad things to happen to good people. In the same way, one must not ask, if black people are strong survivors, then why do they disallow the utterance of the n-word even in referring to it rather than using it? And if one does dare to ask, the answer is inevitably heavier on rhetoric than reasoning. Anti-racism requires one to treat the word as taboo, blasphemous, in all its manifestations, and go in peace, as it were. When someone attests to his white privilege, with his hand up in the air, palm outward, which I have observed more than once, the resemblance to testifying in church need not surprise. Here, the agnostic or atheist American who sees fundamentalists and Mormons as quaint reveals himself as, of all things, a parishioner. Now, McWhorter says that this progression of the movement totally makes sense. His main point is that the movement is a dead end. He makes the following points as to why. One, he questions whether you can actually alter human feelings and thoughts rather than their actions and behavior. Can you actually change people's people's biases or misconceptions about black people through simply preaching to them. He says, quote, is there any evidence that today's religious crusade is making any significant changes in Americans' deepest thoughts or ever could? He also questions the idea that black people need the acceptance of white people and their love to thrive. He questions whether informing white people thoroughly about the injustices that blacks have suffered throughout history is really going to make the change in the world that these proponents of the movement say that they're looking for. McWhorter says, 
says himself in this article that in his experience, if a black person is able to thrive in the practical sense, able to prove themselves and have all the characteristics of a full life, they don't really care what white people think about them. So McWhorter is ultimately not saying that we shouldn't be trying to improve the lives of black Americans, but the whole religious framing of the movement needs to cease. And the things that need to change are not going to be accomplished by educating white people about black oppression and educating white people about how they're complicit in the structures of white supremacy. Right now, I'm going to transition into talking about partner dancing. For those of you who don't know, I do partner dancing, or at least I used to back when the world was normal. I'm involved in a few different scenes, and if you don't know what that means, a scene can be referencing a global phenomenon like the salsa scene, or it can be referencing a locality like the Boston dance scene, or it can be referencing both at the same time. Time, the Boston salsa scene. I should say that from my observation, most dance scenes are still heavily dance focused, focused on teaching people how to dance, helping them have fun, allowing them to meet people, and not about ideology. But the scene I'm a part of is a scene that is not specific to a particular dance. Salsa, Lindy Ha, Bachata, Zouk, Blues. It is a scene called Fusion, where essentially it's dance improv. People from different dance backgrounds, and preferably each with multiple dances under their belt, come together to dance the songs that primarily exist outside of particular genres. So you won't hear a pure salsa song or a pure blues song. You will hear songs that can be danced to using multiple dance forms. So you will either see dancers pick a dance they both know, such as blues, to dance to the song that is playing, which is not blues, but lends itself to blues dancing. Or you might see those dancers, if they have more than one dance form in common, switch back and forth between two, such as blues and West Coast Swing. Or if you have two dancers come together that don't share a primary dance style, they will try to figure out through the course of the dance what their dance styles have in common and how they can speak to each other through the language of the body, through their understanding of the physics of dancing, because there are differences between salsa and West Coast Swing, but spinning is spinning. So pulling your dance back to a more basic structure that you can both use that wouldn't really be recognized as salsa or blues or lindy or whatever you're incorporating, but kind of becomes its own thing. As you might imagine, this is a scene that naturally attracts people who are very high on openness to experience, artistic creative types, which also overlaps a lot with the woke. Also, because you have some more dedicated dancers, a lot of them learn both roles, which if you're not familiar with partner dancing, there is the leader and the follower. Traditionally, men lead and women follow, but in recent years, there's more and more people who learn how to lead and follow because of the link between gender and these roles. Obviously, some people feel oppressed by this, and you'll see a lot of queer, non-binary, etc. people who want to be able to do the opposite role, which fine, but they also bring a lot of ideas about what the norms of the space should be. For example, that you should ask people if they want to lead or follow. That's a whole other topic for discussion, but I want to give you an idea of the kind of community that we're dealing with. Now, with that context about the fusion dance scene itself, I will move specifically into talking about anti-racism. So last summer, during the protests. Our fusion dance scene decided to have a virtual, obviously, event highlighting black voices. Fine, whatever. Do what you want to do. In my opinion, it was a pointless endeavor, an attempt to make themselves look good, and not from any kind of evil place, just from people who felt guilty, which is part of the whole anti-racist religion for white people to feel guilty about what they're not doing. Whereas my question was, okay, you're going to highlight black voices right now, but what is your long-term solution? Because the event centered around hiring black DJs, but only one of the DJs was from our scene. There were a few that were from other dance scenes in the city, and then the rest were from around the country. And the one that was from our actual scene is someone who has never been a regular DJ, a house DJ, but is someone who is being mentored and trained as up and coming, which is fine, but that up and coming DJ is all we've got. We've had guest DJs come in, but he's the only one even poised to be a regular DJ in our scene who is a black 
black person. And there's probably a lot of reasons for that. It's not an easy thing to figure out on your own. You can have an intuition for it, but you need a general training for how to DJ for partner dances. You need training on how to DJ for your particular dance scene in a global sense, salsa versus blues versus Lindy Hop. And then you also need to know how to DJ for your local scene, what the protocols are, what the cultural norms are. So you really need to find a mentor and you need someone to vouch for you. You need some way to demonstrate your skill. Generally, you need to try your hand at a very small event or get a mentor who will let you share some time with them so you can start getting experience. If they were to make a big push and say, we're really looking to mentor black DJs, please contact us. I think that would be a great solution. But having a virtual event where they grab a bunch of black DJs from scenes that are not ours is not going to make a difference when the virtual event is over and none of those DJs DJ in our scene. I also want to make a comment that the black DJs that they pulled are not just like the best black DJs. They're like some of the best DJs in their respective scenes, period. So it's not like they're not being recognized because they're amazing and everyone knows it. Before the event actually occurred, I was added to a group chat because I'm kind of on the outskirts of the organizing crew. I thought it was just going to be something about the event itself, the marketing, logistics, etc. But no, it was about something else entirely. So the head organizer of our scene said she wanted to let us know that she had been working hard behind the scenes on matters of anti-racism. She said, we want to make sure that our space is welcoming for all people, including people of color. And then she referenced the virtual event. She continued, as a part of this, on Monday, I will be publishing a public Black Lives Matter statement. Part of that statement will say something to the effect of, we will be working with our staff on ways in which we can hold ourselves accountable to anti-racism practices. I think it is really important for us as an organization to put effort towards making sure our dance is fighting to make the world more welcoming and fair for people of color. I think that if done right, it can only make us better and stronger. As staff who are in positions of power and set the tone behind the scenes, we need to make sure we are doing some of this anti-racism work for ourselves. The energy of the space and event starts with us. As everyone is on a different road to learning and practicing these things, I expect that each one of us will have different interests and needs. This lead organizer said they would like to check in with each one of us about how we are doing right now and chat about our journeys toward the topic of anti-racism. She said, you have many options to do this. One, you can put something about your thoughts in this group chat. Two, you can start a private chat with me. Three, you and I can set up a Zoom call and chat more in depth. If I can, I will work to point to resources or other people to talk to to help you out with questions or concepts you are particularly interested in. Or we can just talk. I'm looking forward to this as a way to deepen my own understanding of these concepts as well. She continued in a third message. An idea I came up with is to set up a few group live Zoom meetings to read and discuss specific topics, articles, or book chapters we are interested in. This could be a fun way to learn stuff with each other that isn't us sitting at home reading difficult material by ourselves. We could also open it up to either other organizers and other fusion scenes or just friends of ours. I would want it to feel safe and cozy and it would not be mandatory if we did it. I would also be happy to hear any of your collective ideas on how to go about this. Please don't be shy in suggesting a way that we can make our spaces better or come together to learn more about how to make our space more welcoming to buy POC people. So one chick jumped in and said that everyone should jump in on a live streaming event that was happening, which I will come back to in just a bit. This person also said it would be beneficial to include the instructors from different dance scenes that we have hired in recent years because they may be facing the same challenges in their respective scenes. And it also would help to communicate to them what expectations need to be met when teaching at our event in regards to anti-racism stance. I have no idea what that means, how you incorporate an anti-racism stance into your teaching. Is this a declaration you have to make at the beginning of each class that you teach? That this is an anti-racist space? I don't know. Someone else commented that so far they had read How to Be an Anti-Racist, White Fragility, The Color of Law, and Some of the New Jim Crow. And that the first two, How to Be an Anti-Racist and White Fragility, were hugely powerful and valuable in terms of understanding current behaviors and how to reframe to go forward with different behaviors. The other two are hugely valuable in terms of understanding history. They are infuriating and depressing. I'd pick something from the first two. To be honest, even getting through the introduction of how to be an anti-racist is excellent and valuable. I have much more learning to do. I'm definitely open to a different book slash article. And then the lead organizer linked to a Google form, which is still active, where people can leave their feedback anonymously. And the questions include things like, how do you feel when you are at our social? What do you love about our dance? What keeps you coming back? What would allow you to enjoy the dance even more? Do you feel safe at our dance? And then they present certain initiatives that they are considering and they ask which ones would make a difference. And they list one that I mentioned previously in this video.
video, encouraging and training up more DJs of color in our scene. To me, that seems like a pretty practical solution. And then they ask for any comments, changes on their anti-racism statement and resources, which I will now discuss. Their statement says, we believe that we unfortunately exist within a pervasive system of racism in our country. While we have a zero tolerance policy for any kind of harassment, we believe that it is necessary at this time to elaborate on our beliefs and efforts to specifically be an anti-racist organization. What is anti-racism? Anti-racism is the policy or practice of opposing racism and promoting racial tolerance. In our dance spaces, we seek to model social norms that reflect our values. These values may or may not be what we experience in our everyday lives outside of the dance space, but we hope that by living out these values together, we can help inform the world outside of our dance community. We can make a difference to the general public one interaction at a time. I really don't see how being anti-racist within the dance scene helps people have a better experience, say, at their workplace or at the grocery store, but okay. So they have an agreement here. It says, your agreement. By entering the dance space of any of our events, you are agreeing to strive towards the normalization of anti-racist behavior. What does it mean exactly that I'm agreeing to strive towards the normalization of anti-racist behavior? How am I striving? Because this is not a statement directed toward the organizers and scene leaders. This is to anyone who steps into their dance space. Do I have to pull a copy of how to be an anti-racist out of my bag before being allowed to enter? Part of their commitment as an organization is that they will work to provide opportunities to learn about anti-racism and challenging staff to be active participants in the journey towards anti-racism. And they are committed to supporting those who bring attention to racist behavior or comments in this space. They acknowledge that regardless of one's own race or ethnicity, individuals are at various points along an anti-racist journey because bias can be unconscious or unintentional. And racism is a combination of social and institutional power plus racial prejudice. Prejudice plus power. Don't forget the new definition. You might get caught out if you're believing that, you know, original definition of racism. Wouldn't want that. Identifying these two specific forms of oppression and disparate outcomes do not automatically mean that those involved intended negative impact, but nevertheless harm is done. Having these conversations requires courage, respect, and compassion, and may not always be comfortable. We encourage attendees and organizers to be introspective and critically think about their actions, both before they make them and when feedback is given. It is a gift to be given the opportunity to see how someone else might hear your words or actions, regardless of your intent. If anyone notices or experiences racism or harassment of any kind, you are asked to bring it up to our staff so we can monitor and take action on the interactions happening in our space. I get it. I haven't been in the partner dance scene for as long as a lot of people, but I know that not all scenes really care that much about people being overtly racist. So fine, you want to have a code of conduct, you want to set the expectations, you want to make people feel comfortable, fine. But telling people that if they report racism that they experience or that they see will be taken seriously is different than saying that everyone who walks into this dance space agrees to strive toward the normalization of anti-racist practices. Then they list values that they have always worked to normalize throughout their dance space and that each of these values is an anti-racist statement in itself, which I find very confusing. So when I was added to this group chat and I read the messages, I felt stuck because everyone could see that I had read the messages but was not replying and everyone else in the group chat replied, but there is no way in hell I'm gonna lie about actively participating in anti-racist work because I try to follow Peterson's notion of not saying things that make you feel weak. And I also got really pissed off because I kind of felt like, who are you to be saying any of this to me? To be telling me that I need to learn more about black people and how to help them when I would bet all of my life savings that you have never heard of half of the black voices that I follow on a regular basis that I have consumed hours of video content from. People like Thomas Sowell, Walter Williams, Coleman Hughes, John McWhorter, Glenn Lowry, Larry Elder, Eric July, Camille Foster, and so many others from across the political spectrum. People who are more laymen, people who are academics, and I've been doing that for a while. So for this person to all of a sudden, after their there is some unrest in the country to come to me and be like, let's have a discussion about the anti-racist work that you're doing was frankly really hard to take. It was really hard for me to not just be like, go fuck yourself, except for the fact that I really like dancing. Part of me wanted to be like, you should really check out Coleman Hughes. But also I didn't actually want to get in discussion, especially because this was a group of entirely women. And as anyone who's watched my channel for long enough will know, groups of women 
women is one of my least favorite social dynamics to be a part of because they're not actually interested in having a discussion about reality. They're interested in having a discussion about feelings and how can we be good people in the correct way because groups of women in general are not interested in having uncomfortable conversations. Even when they say they're interested in having uncomfortable conversations, what they're saying is, I'm comfortable having an uncomfortable conversation as long as it follows a script that I learned from someone else. If you say anything to contradict this, I might listen to you for a while, but I'm going to secretly think that you're bad. And if I can't educate you, I will cast you out and I will enlist others to make sure that no one wants to associate with you ever again. So good times. Earlier, I referenced that there was this virtual streaming event that someone in the group chat said that we should join. And it was a discussion between black thought leaders, mostly in the Lindy Hop scene, I think, but they were also speaking more generally. And I didn't listen to the entire thing, but I listened to it at two times fast and scrubbed through at various points. And one of the themes that came up repeatedly was the idea of how black people have a different way of expressing themselves that comes from culture and that many of them have felt unwelcome in certain scenes because of the way that they dance, that after dancing with them, people don't want to dance with them again because it's not what they expected, it's not what they like, it's not what they're used to. And I totally hear what they're saying, but I don't know how you change that from a top-down level. Do you hold a class explaining to people that people dance differently and the way that Black people dance is not worse and actually they invented these dances and you should should enjoy the way that they dance. People have preferences, which come from a lot of different places. One of the key values in the fusion scene is consent. The one statement that I will read from their list of values is personal freedom to make our own choices about who and when we touch people. So you get to decide who you dance with. Just because you dance with someone earlier in the night doesn't mean you have to dance with them again later. Just because you dance with someone last time doesn't mean you have to dance with them now. There are plenty of people across races and ethnicities that I don't like dancing with for various reasons because of how they dance. That isn't necessarily bad. Someone else may enjoy the way they dance, but I don't. We're not compatible. So what are you going to be able to do concretely to make the white people that predominate these scenes feel more comfortable with the way black people naturally dance? I really don't have any ideas because I've danced with all the black people in all of our scenes, and I enjoy dancing with 90% of them. There's a couple I don't enjoy dancing with that has nothing to do with them being black, but either them being arrogant or them being physically dangerous to dance with, meaning they've hurt me. It's all well and good to talk about the history of these dances and how white people stole them from them, etc., etc. but what the heck do you want people to actually do about it? There's only one guy who addressed the issue that I always bring up, which is how do you actually get new black people to dance in the scene, not just to DJ or teach? And how do you get them to stick around? Maybe it's because he's from Europe, so he's not burdened by a lot of the American conversation and perspective on race and the victim mentality that's been married to identity categories. But he said that we have to remember that partner dancing in general is a privileged activity as it exists for most people. Most of the dance scenes are centered around wealthier areas. Lessons cost money. Socials cost money. Private lessons cost money. And they're not cheap. So he goes to those less privileged areas. He talks about starting scenes in those areas, starting dances in those areas, bringing them to those places. He also talked about the fact that with Lindy Hop in particular, and this also applies to blues, they are teaching a vintage dance. And what kids want to dance, what young people want to dance, is what's contemporary. Lindy Hop was contemporary at one point, and so young people wanted to dance it, but now it's not. So how do you get them to dance it? And he said he teaches them street dances, and then kind of tricks them into learning swing dance. And he said it's not for him to wait for white people to make this change. And that also makes sense to me because part of what they were saying is that people People need to see representation, they need to see the black teachers, they need to see the black DJs. So my reaction is, well then shouldn't it be black people who are going out and recruiting more black people to come into the scenes to teach to the young black people who aren't aware of this part of their history? They're already complaining about white people having taken this dance from them, so why shouldn't it be on them to attract more black people if they're saying that the representation is what will bring them? They will feel more comfortable knowing that there is black black people there. So he brings up that issue that you have to change the points of accessibility for people to enter your dance. So I don't know what I'm going to do when dancing actually starts up again. I love the fusion dance 
scene, but it's not my primary scene. The other two scenes that I'm involved with, one of them I think is probably going to die off by the time COVID protocols would allow for it to be revived. And the other one is just starting to get its first taste of wokeness. Maybe I'll switch to a different dance that is not as woke. I don't know. Honestly, I don't care about any of this stuff. I don't care if the people that I'm dancing with are anti-racist activists. I don't care if the people I'm dancing with are anarcho-primitivists or uber progressives or hipsters. If they can dance well and we can have a good dance together, that's literally all I care about. So yeah, as with all my anti-feminist diaries videos, this was mostly a ramble about some things that you guys probably know about, like anti-racism and relating it to something in my life that maybe you weren't as aware of because I don't know what percentage of my viewers are involved in any partner dance scenes. If any of you are, I welcome your thoughts and experiences. Thank you for watching. If you liked this video, please give it a like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe, and I hope to have more content for you very soon.